starting this section and the next couple, we're going to start to look at the Docker client or Docker CLI inside of our terminal a little bit more and learn about some of the very basic commands that we use to interact with Docker containers and images. Now, fair warning here, some of these sections are going to be a little bit boring because we're essentially just going to be typing in commands and looking at the output that comes, but I'm going to do my best to make sure to share a lot of interesting information with you along the way. So let's get to it. The first command that we're going to look at is one that we ran very briefly before. It is the command that we're going to use to run, or excuse me, to create and run a container using an image. So at the command line, we're going to execute docker run, and then the name of the image that we want to use as the basis for this container. Now we've already gone through this process once before. At the command line, we ran docker run hello-world. And then we saw that message appear on the screen. Now, using the knowledge that you now have about what a Docker container really is, I want you to think about what probably just occurred when we ran that command. Chances are that somewhere on our hard disk is an image that has that file system snapshot with one single program inside of it. Maybe that thing is called, I don't know, hello world, who knows what it's really called. So when we executed Docker run hello world, we took that little snapshot of the hard drive, we stuck it into this little container thing, or this kind of grouping of resources, and then we executed the command run hello world. And so the running process up here was hello world, that thing ran, and then eventually exited. So that's what is happening behind the scenes when you execute that command. Now there's a lot of variations on this docker run command and a lot of very small subtleties around it. So let's take a quick pause. We're going to come back to the next section. We're going to start looking at some of the interesting features around the run command. So I'll see you in just a minute. In this section, we're going to continue looking at the docker run command or some slight variations of it. Now, before I show you the next kind of variation on this command that we're going to look at, I want to give you one quick reminder. Remember, any time that we execute docker run with an image, we not only get that file system snapshot, but we also get this default command that is supposed to be executed after the container is created. So the variation on docker run that we're going to look at is going to give you a way to override this default startup command. Here's how we do it. We'll execute docker run the image name, just like we did before. And then after that, we'll supply a alternate command to be executed inside the container after it starts up. This is an override. So whatever default command is included inside of the image is not going to be executed. Let's try this out right now and just see how it works. All right, so I'm going to find my terminal and I'm going to execute docker run. And then I'm going to specify my image. We're going to use a different image than what we used before. We're going to use an image called BusyBox, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. After that, we'll list out the alternate command to execute inside the container after it is created. And so I'm going to say that I want to run a command echo hi there. So this right here is the override. This is a command that will be executed inside that container. The echo command is going to print out hi there inside my terminal. So if this works the way we would expect, I'll see the text hi there appear. So I'm going to run that, and sure enough, yep, we see that. We can change the text provided here to the echo command as much as we please. So I could say, bye there, or I could say, how are you? You get the idea. Now I wanna show you a small variation on that command. And this is going to start to make things a little bit more interesting than just kind of echoing text back over to you. I want you to run docker run busybox, and then the override command that we're gonna use this time is going to be ls. If you've never used ls before, it's going to print out all the files and folders inside of a given directory. So let's try running this and see what happens. So according to our Docker container, when we print out our files and folders, we have bin, etsy, dev, home, proc, root, sys, temp, user, and var. These are all folders right here. And if you are on, say, a Windows machine right here, these folders might look very strange to you and very unfamiliar. So in fact, these are folders that are being printed out that are not belonging to you on your computer. These are folders that exist solely inside that container. I want to remind you about exactly what happens when we create a container out of an image. So over here, we've got the BusyBox image. It has some default file system snapshot and some presumably default command. You know, who knows what it is off the top of my head, but it definitely has this default file system snapshot. The BusyBox image has default folders of bin, dev, etsy, home, proc, root, and so on, all the ones that you see listed right here. 
So when we create a new container out of that image, we take this file system snapshot, we stick it in as the folder for that container, and then the command that we execute is ls. So we list out all the files and folders inside of our hard drive, which then prints out bin, dev, etc, home, proc, and root. So that's pretty much it. Now, one thing you might be a little bit curious about is why we chose to use the BusyBox image here as opposed to the Hello World one that we were using before. Well, let's go back over to our terminal really quickly, and we're going to try running Hello World with the ls command. So I'll do docker run hello-world, and I'll do ls right here. And you're going to very quickly see that we get a kind of nasty error message. Well, let's try doing the echo command and see what happens. I'll do docker run hello world echo hi there, and we get a very similar error message here as well. So what's going on? Well, here's the issue. When we run the alternate commands, or those alternate echo and ls commands with BusyBox, those commands work because ls and echo are two programs that exist inside of the BusyBox file system image. Somewhere inside of this folder system right here is a ls command, or an actual ls executable, and a echo executable as well. And so we can safely execute those commands with BusyBox because those are programs that exist inside this file system. However, with our Hello World program over here, the only thing that exists inside this file system snapshot is a single program, like one single file. And all that thing does is echo out or kind of print out that singular message that we saw when we ran that container. So these startup commands that we are executing are being based upon the file system included with the image. And if we try to execute a command inside the container that uses a program that doesn't or is not contained within this file system, we're going to see that error. Okay, so a little bit more on Docker run command. Let's take another quick break right now and continue in the next section. In this section, we're gonna take another look at a very commonly used command. So the command that we're gonna look at is docker ps. This command will list all the different running containers that are currently on your machine. Let's try running it right now and just seeing what happens. I'll flip on over to my terminal and I'll run docker ps. When I run this command, you're going to see some headers for a table. At present, we have no containers running our machine, so we have no entries inside this table. At this point, we've only been running images or creating containers that run very quickly and then immediately close down. So for example, when we were running docker run busybox and echo hi there, that container starts up and then almost immediately exits us back to the command line. So if we want docker ps to be meaningful at all, we have to have some container that is running for some longer amount of time. In order to get a container running a little bit longer, we could substitute the command that is executed when that container starts up. So rather than running echo hi there, I'll try docker run busybox, and then I'll do ping google.com. This is a command that's going to attempt to ping Google servers and measure the amount of latency. It's a command that's going to continue running for a quite a long time. So here it is running right here, and as you can see, it takes about two or three milliseconds for me to ping Google and get a response back. This command is going to continue running, so we can now run docker ps in a second window, and we should see this container up here in the listing. I'm going to open up a second terminal window and then I'll execute docker ps. And when I do so, I'll then see that running container. I'm going to get this on one line really quickly. There we go. So this is a print up for the container that is currently running that was issued the command of ping google.com. We also see the container's ID, which we can use for a lot of other operations that we'll look into later on. We'll see the image that was used for the container. We can see how long ago it was created. We get a status. Currently, it's been up for 24 seconds. We'll see a listing of any ports that have been opened for outside access. And we're going to talk a lot about ports later on inside this course. And at the very end, we'll also see a randomly generated name to identify this container. In my case, the randomly generated name was Epic Cory. If I now flip back over to that running ping process, I can press Control C on my keyboard to stop it. So I'll press Control C right now, and I get kicked back to my command line. As you might expect, if I then run Docker PS a second time, I would not see that container anymore. So Docker PS specifically shows running containers.
We can modify the docker ps command just a little bit to show all containers that have ever been created on our machine. To do so, we can execute docker ps dash dash all. Oh, just two dashes, there we go. When we execute that command, we'll see a listing of all the containers that we have ever created. And so I'm going to zoom out again, again here really quickly just so I can see this table. There we go. So for every one of these containers, these have all been containers that we have started up and then have either been shut down on our behalf or shut down naturally. So for each one of them, we'll see the container ID, image, command, when it was created, its current status, in this case, they're all exited, any ports that have been opened up, again, we'll talk about those later, and the randomly generated name for each one. So in practice, we're going to end up using the docker ps command quite a bit to see what containers are currently running on our machine. One of the most common uses of docker ps is not only to see what's running, but also to get the ID of a running container. Because like I said, we very frequently want to issue commands on a very specific container, and for that we need its ID. All right, so that's the docker ps command. Let's take a quick pause right here and continue in the next section. In the last section, we ran the docker ps command, and we saw one variation of it, which was docker ps dash dash all. When we ran dash dash all on here, we saw that we got a print up of all the containers we'd ever started up on our machine, which was kind of interesting because it kind of begs the question, when does a container like really get shut down? Why does it get shut down? And what happens when it gets shut down? So starting this section, I want to start to show you a little bit around the life cycle of a container, which is going to give you a better idea of what's going on behind the scenes. Now, before first investigating or just jumping to the end, like figuring out what happens when a container gets shut down, I want to kind of go all the way to the start and really figure out what happens when a container is first created. Now we've learned at this point that to start up a new container from an image, we use the docker run command. But when we looked at this diagram, remember we looked at this diagram like two or three sections ago, you'll notice that I had put some very particular terminology here. I said creating and running a container. Creating a container and actually starting it up are actually two separate processes. So there's actually two additional commands in addition to docker run that we can use to start up a new container. Docker run, running that at your command line, is identical to running two other commands together. First, docker create, and then docker start. As you might guess, the docker create commands is used to create a container out of an image, and then start is used to actually start an image. But at this point, you might be a little bit curious of, hey, what's the distinction between creating a container and actually starting a container? Let's look at a diagram that's going to help you understand the differences between the two. So we've looked at a diagram like this several times before. Remember on our image over here, we've got that kind of file system snapshot of sorts. And we've also got a startup command. The process of creating a container is where we kind of take the file system in here and kind of prep it for use in this new container. When we create the container, we're just talking about kind of prepping or setting up this file system snapshot to be used to create the container. To actually start the container, that's when we actually execute this startup command that might start up the process of like, hello world, or in the case of that busy box one that we used, the echo hi there, or whatever process is supposed to be executed inside the container. So again, creating a container is about the file system Starting it is about actually executing the startup command. So with that in mind, let's try flipping over to our command line really quickly, and we're going to start to investigate the differences between creating a container and starting a container. Over at my, my command line, I'm going to first try running the docker create and start commands with the hello world image. So I will first do docker create hello dash world. When I run that command, I get this long string of characters printed out. This is the ID of the container that was just created. I can now actually execute the hello world command inside of this container by running docker start. And then I'm going to add on a little argument here. I'm going to say dash a. We'll talk about what that is in just a second. And then I'm going to paste the ID that was just emitted right here. So I'm going to paste in that really long series of characters. And then when I run this command, we'll see that familiar welcome message appear. So what happened here? Well, again, first off, we kind of prep the container by getting that file system ready. 
Then after that, we actually executed the primary startup command in there with Docker start. Now, what was with the dash A right there? Well, to show you what's going on with that, let's try running Docker start again, but without the dash A. So I'm gonna run Docker start, and then I'm going to again paste in, oops, I lost the thing, I gotta do the create again very quickly. So there's my ID, and I'll do Docker start, but without the dash A this time. So when I run Docker start, you'll notice that I just see the ID. The dash A command is what's going to make Docker actually watch for output from the container and print it out to your terminal. So the dash A specifically means, hey, kind of attach to the container, so to speak, and watch for output coming from it and print it out at my terminal. So when I put on docker start dash A, that means give me any output that is coming from that thing. And when I run that, boom, there it is. So you'll notice that's a very small difference between docker run and docker start. By default, docker run is going to show you all the logs or all the information coming out of the container. By default, docker start is the opposite. Docker start is not going to show you information coming out of the terminal. All right, so that's the differences between docker run and docker start and docker create. Let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next section and we'll talk a little bit more about exactly what it meant when we saw with the docker ps all that exited status. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we started investigating the life cycle of a container by using the docker create and docker start commands. We're now gonna to start to investigate the status of some of those containers that we've already started up on our machine, but have closed down for some particular reason. So we can print those all out with docker ps dash dash all. You'll notice that I have just one container listed as exited now, whereas before I had like 30. The reason for that is that I ran a command between the last video and this one to kind of par down that list. And of course, I will show you that command in just a second as well. So at this point, the only stopped or exited container that I have on my machine is this one right here. Let's try creating and running and then stopping one more container just to make sure that we're kind of on level footing. So I'm going to execute docker run busybox echo hi there. If I then do docker ps dash dash all again, and then zoom out so I can see this a little bit better, there we go. I'll see the ID of that container. I'll see the echo hi there and I can definitely verify that its status is definitely exited right now. When a container is exited, we can still start it back up. So just because a container stopped doesn't mean that it's like dead or cannot be used again. We can very easily stop and then start containers again at some point in the future. To start a container back up, we can take its ID and then execute docker start and paste that ID in. Remember that if we use docker start without the dash a flag, however, we won't see any output from it. And so it might be a little bit more useful to do docker start dash a and then the ID. And when I do that, you'll notice that it printed out hi there again, which is kind of interesting. Well, let's take a look at a diagram to really understand this entire series of commands that we just issued. All right, here we go. So we've got our busy box image. And at some point in time, we definitely ran docker create or docker run. That took our file system snapshot and essentially got a reference to it inside the container. We then provided that override command of echo hi there. So that was the primary running command inside the container. That command ran, it then completed, the container exited naturally. When we then ran the docker start command a second time, what happened was the running process or this primary command was issued a second time inside the container. When you have a container that's already been created, we cannot replace that default command. As soon as you start it up with the default command, that's it. The default command is then in place. So we cannot do something like say docker start dash a the ID and then try to replace the default command. I can't do something like echo by there. So in theory, this would be us trying to replace the default command. Again, can't do that. And if we try to run it, it's going to misinterpret the command that we just issued. It's thinking that we're trying to start up multiple containers at the same time. So once we have started up a container and let it exit, we can start it back up again, which is going to reissue the default command that was used when the container was first created. All right, now it might seem like going over all this life cycle stuff is kind of unimportant. It might seem like I'm going really far into the weeds with it, but trust me, 
having a solid understanding of the life cycle of a container is going to be so incredibly useful later on when it really comes down to figuring out how to troubleshoot these things and debug a running container. So I think we got a better idea on the, the life cycle of a container. So let's take another quick break and continue in the next section. In the last section, I had mentioned that I had cleared out all the stopped containers on my machine. And so I thought you might be curious on how I did that. If I run docker ps dash dash all right now, I can see that I currently have two stopped containers. So these containers right now are essentially just taking up disk space on my computer. And so it might be to my advantage to try to entirely delete them and not just leave them in this stopped state. To delete all these containers, I can run docker system prune. I'll then be presented with a warning here. So just to be clear, this is not only going to delete stopped containers, it's also going to delete a couple of either items as well, most notably your build cache. The build cache is any image that you have fetched from Docker Hub. So after running Docker Prune, you will have to re-download images from Docker Hub, which is not a really big deal. Just be aware that you're going to have to wait a couple minutes the next time you start up a container. Not really a couple of minutes, but a couple of seconds, really. So we can enter in yes, hit enter, and then it will tell us about the deleted containers, and it'll tell me also how much space has been reclaimed by deleting those resources. If I then do another docker ps dash dash all, I'll see that I do not have any stopped containers whatsoever. I really recommend you keep the docker system prune command in mind because anytime that you're kind of done working with Docker for a period of weeks or months, or if you decide you just don't want to work with Docker again at all, you will want to run this command to delete any containers that are still just kind of sitting around eating up disk space. All right, let's take another quick break and we'll continue in the next section. We were just talking about the differences between starting and creating a container. Along the way, we ran the command docker create and then something like busybox echo hi there. We then got this printout of the container ID that was created. And then we found that we could start up the container by running docker start and then pasting the ID in. However, there is a real little catch to that. We found that in order to actually see information being printed out from the container, we had to add in that dash a flag right there. So what would happen if you wanted to get all the output from the container without having to add in that dash a flag? For example, let's imagine that running Docker start like this was a really expensive process. And we started up a process inside there with, that would take many minutes to run. Chances are, if we forgot to add on the dash a flag to see the output from that, we might be a little bit frustrated with ourselves because then we would have to rerun Docker start dash a a second time and wait another couple minutes. In order to get around that, we can make use of an additional command of docker logs and then the ID of the container that we want to get output from. The logs command can be used to look at a container and retrieve all the information that has been emitted from it. Let's try using that docker create, start, and then logs command again and seeing what happens. So I will do docker create busybox and I will echo hi there. I'll then take that ID and run docker start and paste the ID. That starts up the container. It executes echo hi there inside of it, and then it immediately exits. And so now at this point, I want to go back to that stopped container and get all the logs that have been emitted inside of it. So to do so, I can run docker logs and then paste that ID in. And I'll see that when the container had been running, it had printed out the string hi there. One thing to be really clear about is that by running Docker logs, I'm not rerunning or restarting the container to any, in any way, shape, or form. I'm just getting a record of all the logs that have been emitted from that container. The Docker logs command is something that we're going to be using quite a bit as we are trying to debug or set up new containers, because as you can see, it's a really good way to kind of inspect a container and see what's going on inside of it. All right, still a couple more commands to get through. So let's take another quick pause right here and continue in the next section. In all these commands we've been running with Docker create and start, there's kind of one oddity that I want to show you really quickly. Let's do a container creation and then a start and you'll see some kind of weird behavior. I'm going to run Docker create busybox and then we're going to set up that ping command again. So I'll say ping google.com. That's going to create the container. I can then copy the ID right here and do docker start 
and paste that ID. And you'll notice that I did not put in the dash A. So I have not attached this container. When I run that command, I see the ID of the container echoed back to me. And then I can do a docker logs and paste that ID in. And I'll see that, yep, it is in fact running the ping command. And if I do the docker ps command, I can see, yep, that container is running and it's continuing to execute the ping command. Now there's just one kind of odd thing here. How do we actually stop this container? Remember, the ping command is going to essentially go on forever and we have to actually send it a signal and tell it, hey, ping command, please stop, like you're all done. No need to reach out to Google anymore. So we need to figure out a way to stop this running container. In the past, we've just been hitting Control C on our keyboard, or we've allowed the container to automatically stop itself, as was the case uh, with the echo command. So in order to stop a container that seems to be running amok on its own, we can issue either the docker stop command or the docker kill command. Both these are going to stop the running container but they look like they kind of do the same thing here. So what's the difference between them? Well, here's what happens behind the scenes. When you issue a Docker stop command, a hardware signal is sent to the process or the primary process inside that container. In the case of Docker stop, we send a SIG term message, which is short for terminate signal. It's a message that's going to be received by the process telling it essentially to shut down on its own time. SIG term is used anytime that you want to stop a process inside of your container and shut the container down, and you want to give that process inside there a little bit of time to shut itself down and do a little bit of cleanup. A lot of different programming languages have the ability for you to listen for these signals inside of your code base. And as soon as you get that signal, you could attempt to do a little bit of cleanup or maybe save some file or emit some message or something like that. On the other hand, the docker kill command issues a sig kill or kill s signal to the primary running process inside the container. Sig kill essentially means you have to shut down right now and you do not get to do any additional work. So ideally, we always stop a container with the docker stop command in order to give the running process inside of it a little bit of time to shut itself down. Otherwise, if it feels like the container has locked up and it's not responding to the docker stop command, then we could issue docker kill instead. Now, one kind of little oddity or interesting thing about docker stop, when you issue docker stop to a container, if the container does not automatically stop in 10 seconds, then docker is going to automatically fall back to issuing the docker kill command. So essentially, docker stop is us being nice, but it has only got 10 seconds to actually shut down. So let's now try using these commands on that kind of runaway container that we have right now. So I'll again do docker ps, and I'll see that the ping google.command, or excuse me, ping google.com container is still running. So I'm gonna take the ID right there, and I'll issue docker stop, and then I'll paste that ID in. And then we're gonna wait, and notice how we're kind of waiting here? We're gonna end up waiting just about 10 seconds. We're waiting 10 seconds because it turns out that the ping command does not properly respond to a sig term message. The ping command doesn't really have the ability to say, oh yeah, I understand you want me to shut down. The, the ping command is rather, I don't know, what's the term for it? The ping command wants to do its own thing and it just wants to run forever. And so after we waited those 10 seconds, eventually the kill signal was sent to it telling it, hey, ping, you're done, get out of here, shut yourself down. And so that's why we had to wait a couple of seconds. Let's now take that container ID again. We're going to start the container back up and try killing it this time with using docker kill. So I'll first start the container back up with docker start, and I'll paste the ID in. And then I'll issue a docker kill and paste the ID again. And then this time you're going to see that's it, instantly dead, no grace period, just get out of here. All right, so that's it. That's the two commands that we're going to use for closing down containers that are running. Remember, you can always get the ID of the container ahead of time with Docker PS. You can copy the ID and then run either Docker stop or Docker kill. And in general, I do recommend you use Docker stop to give the processes inside there a chance to shut down. And if they don't shut down nicely, nicely, as we saw with the ping command, eventually Docker is going to fall back to issuing a kill on the container instead. All right, so that's pretty much it. Let's take another brief pause and continue in the next section. 
Much earlier in this course, like in the first one or two sections, you saw me start up a new copy of Redis on my computer by using Docker. As a reminder, Redis is an in-memory data store that is very commonly used with web applications. You saw me start up a Redis instance using Docker, and it seemed to be really easy and very straightforward. But I want to show you kind of an oddity around using Redis with Docker very quickly. I took the liberty of installing Redis on my local machine directly without Docker being involved whatsoever, because I want to show you the normal way in which we might interact with Redis. I'm going to first start up an instance of the Redis server by running Redis server. Now, again, I am able to run this command because I installed Redis on my local machine without Docker involved. Chances are you do not have Redis installed on your computer, so don't try to run this command because it's probably going to result in an error. Now, when I run that command, you're going to see that, yep, I get an instance of the Redis server running. It's in memory. It's ready to store data or do whatever I need it to do. The, one of the very common ways in which we can kind of poke into this thing or into the server and inspect the data that is inside of it is by using a second program called the Redis CLI. So on my computer, I've already got Redis server running. I'm going to now start up a second program called Redis CLI. And again, the entire purpose of this thing is to kind of reach into that server and poke around inside of it. So I'm going to open up a second terminal window and I'll run Redis CLI. And that gives me a little prompt right here that allows me to issue commands directly to the running Redis server. And so I can do something like store my number, or excuse me, not store, but set my number is five. And then I can then retrieve that value and it prints out five. So this right here is the normal interaction that you would see with Redis with Redis CLI. Clearly, it's really nice to be able to run the Redis CLI and interact directly with information inside that running Redis server. All right, so now you're probably wondering, where am I going with this? Well, let's try starting up Redis using Docker, and then you're going to very quickly see some interesting behavior around Redis CLI. So let's give it a shot. I'm going to stop my running stuff, and then I'm going to start up an instance of Redis on my machine using Docker run Redis. Now it's going to start up just about instantly for me. For you, it might take a second or two as it has to download the image, but overall it should be pretty darn quick. When you start up Redis, you might see a couple of warnings. Those are totally fine. You can ignore them. Just make sure that the very last line that you see is something that says ready to accept connections. So as long as you see that, you're good to go. All right, so this right here, what we are running right here is the Redis server. So I now want to start up a copy of the Redis CLI and try to work with the information that is being handled inside of the server. As you saw just a moment ago, I was able to open up a second console window and run Redis CLI. So well, maybe for Docker being involved here, maybe we just have to run like Redis CLI here. Oh no, that clearly doesn't do anything. Maybe we need to start up a second terminal window and try running Redis CLI there. Let's try that. We'll open up a second window and then run Redis CLI. Now, chances are you're going to see a message that says something like command not recognized or command not found. I see something that says could not connect to Redis. So what's going on here? Well, let's look at a diagram. So just a second ago, we started up a new container that is running Redis server. Now, Redis is running only inside this container. So if I tried to run Redis CLI outside the container, Outside the container, I have no access to anything that's going on inside there. And so there is no Redis CLI command to run outside the container. If we want to start up the CLI, we need to somehow get into this container and execute a second command inside of it, like this. We need to start up a second program inside the container. So to figure out how to do so, let's take a quick break. We'll come back to the next section and figure out how we can execute a second command inside of a running container. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we started up a new copy of the Redis container image. Inside there, we have a running copy of the Redis server. And we now need to figure out how we can somehow start up the Redis CLI also inside of that container. To do so, we're going to be making use of another Docker command. So the Docker command we're going to use is docker exec. Exec is short for execute, and we use it to execute an additional command inside of a container. We're going to write docker exec. We'll then put down it dash it. This little argument right here allows us to type input directly into the container. We then provide the container ID and then the command that we want to execute inside of the container. 
So let's try doing this right now and seeing what happens. I'm going to first go back over to my terminal. I'm going to verify that my Redis container is still running. I can either look at it inside the running window. Alternatively, I could run Docker PS and see, yep, I still have that Redis image still going. So then to start up a second program inside the container, I'll run Docker exec. Oops, forgot one thing here. We got to get the container's ID. We'll do Docker PS and there's the ID right there. So I'll do docker exec dash it. I'll paste in the ID and then the command that I want to execute inside there is redis dash CLI. And when I do so, you'll see that I now get that a little bit more familiar looking command prompt here. And I can write out something like set my value five and get my value and it retrieves five. So by using the exec command, we were able to start up a second running program inside of our container. And the dash IT flag right here allowed us to enter in text on our keyboard and have it be sent into that running container. As a very quick exercise, let's try removing the IT flag there and seeing what happens. I'm gonna exit this by hitting Control C on my keyboard, and then I'll do Docker exec again, but this time I'm going to leave off the IT flags. So I'll do docker exec, the ID, and then Redis CLI. And you'll notice that this time around, I just got kicked directly back to my terminal. I got kicked directly back because Redis CLI was started up, but we did not get the ability to enter in any text. So when Redis CLI was started up, but it very quickly realized, hey, I don't have any possibility of getting any text input, it decided to just entirely close down and kick us back to our terminal. Now this idea behind kind of adding on this IT flag and adding in text here is actually something that's rather important in the world of Docker. So let's take a quick pause right here and we're going to come back in the next section and kind of expand upon what IT right here means. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we found that we were able to connect to Redis CLI inside of our running Docker container. And notice how mine is still running over here on the second window by adding on the dash IT flag. So when I did that, we saw, yep, we got this prompt here. We could enter stuff in. I could then press control C to exit back out. However, if I tried running this command without the IT flag, it appeared that I just got kicked directly back over to my terminal. So in this section, I wanna give you a better idea of what this dash IT flag right here is really doing for us. The first thing you need to understand is a little bit more about how processes run inside of a Linux environment. As a quick reminder, when you are running Docker on your machine, every single container that you are running is running inside of a virtual machine running Linux. So these processes are really being executed inside of a Linux world, even if you're on Mac or Windows. All right, so with that in mind, in this diagram, we've got three different running processes, all inside, in theory, of a running container or really inside of a Linux environment. Every process that we create in a Linux environment has three communication channels attached to it that we refer to as standard in, standard out, and standard air. These channels are used to communicate information either into the process or out of the process. Standard in, as you might guess, is used to communicate information into the process. So when you are at your terminal and you type stuff in, the stuff you type is being directed into a running standard in channel attached to say the Redis CLI. The standard out channel that is attached to any given process is going to convey information that is coming from the process. So standard out might be redirected over to your running terminal and that's gonna end up as being stuff that is gonna show up on the screen. Standard error is very similar, but it conveys information out of the process that is kind of like an error in nature. So if Redis CLI has some error inside of it, that's going to be communicated to the outside world over the standard error channel. And very similar to standard out, that's going to be redirected to show up on the screen of your terminal. So how does that relate to the IT flag when we do the docker exec dash IT? Well, the IT right here is actually two separate little flags. In reality, it's a dash I and a dash T, like so. But by convention, we usually just kind of shorten it down to be simply IT, which is 100% equivalent to the two separate flags. The dash I on here means when we execute this new command inside the container, we want to attach our terminal to the standard in channel of that new running process. 
So by adding on the dash I flag, we are saying make sure that any stuff that I type gets directed to standard in of Redis CLI. The dash T flag is what kind of makes all this text show up a little bit pretty. Now, in reality, it's doing a little bit more than that, but at the end of the day, the real effect that the dash T flag is to make sure that all the text that you are entering in and that is coming out shows up in a nicely formatted manner on your screen. And again, it's doing a little bit more behind the scenes than that, but at the end of the day, that's kind of its effect. Let's try attaching or doing our Docker exec on the running container one more time and leaving off the dash T flag and just seeing what happens. So I'll do a docker ps to get my containers ID again. Then I'll do a docker exec, and then we'll do only dash i this time. I'll put the ID in, and then I'll do redis cli. And so now this time, you'll notice how I have my cursor over here. It appears that this thing is waiting for input, but I didn't, do not see that kind of nicely formatted indentation I saw before. And if I put in like set my value five before I had a little bit of autocomplete functionality, but this time that autocomplete is definitely not there. I can still run that command though, and I still see okay, and I can still do get my value, and I still see the value come out. But again, all, all this stuff is not nicely formatted. And so that's kind of the purpose, more or less kind of simplifying things here just a little bit of that dash T flag. Okay, so that's pretty much it. That's the purpose of IT. It allows us to have stuff that we type into our terminal directed into that running process and allows us to get information out back over to our terminal. So with that in mind, let's take a quick break right here and continue in the next section. In the last section, we learned about the importance of the dash IT flag. In this section, I wanna tell you about one last use of the docker exec command. And this use of it is probably going to be the most common that you're going to be making use of on your own personal projects. A very common thing that you're going to want to do when you are using Docker is to get shell access or terminal access to your running container. In other words, you are going to want to run commands inside of your container without having to rerun docker exec, docker exec, docker exec again and again all day. So in this section, I'm going to show you how you can open up a shell or a terminal in the context of your running container. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to flip back over to my terminal. I'm gonna verify that I'm still running that Redis container. I'm gonna open up a second terminal window. Inside of here, I'm going to run docker ps and get my container ID. And then I'm going to run docker exec dash it. I'll put the container ID in, and then here's the magic. I'm gonna put in sh. And we'll talk about what sh is in just a second. I'm gonna run that command, and you'll see that I get the little pound over here. Once I'm in here, I can now start to type out typical commands that I would expect to be able to run in a Unix environment. So for example, I could change my directory to my home directory. I could list out the files and folders inside there, nothing there right now. Let's try going back to the root directory of slash. And then if I do an ls, I'll see all the root files and folders of the container. I could execute commands like echo hi there. I can export variables, uh, environment variables, like export b equals five, and then echo that. So essentially, when I make use of this docker exec command with sh over here, I get full terminal access inside the context of the container, which is extremely powerful for debugging. I could even do things like, say, run the docker CLI directly, or I mean, not docker CLI, but Redis CLI, and that starts up the Redis CLI. And then when I'm all done, I can hit control C, and it looks like nothing's happening. So quick shortcut here, if you ever are in a container and it feels like you can't hit control C to exit, you can always try hitting command D, or excuse me, control D to get out as well. All right, so we'll, let's talk about what just happened there. So we ran docker exec, which we've seen several times before, and then we did SH. So what is SH? Well, SH is the name of a program. And it's a program that is being executed inside of that container. SH is a command processor or a shell. It's something that allows us to type commands in and have them be executed inside that container. You are already making use of a program very much like SH on your own computer. Chances are, if you're on Mac OS, you are probably using something like Bash. If you're on Windows, you're probably using something like Git Bash or PowerShell. Me personally, I'm making use of Z Shell. These are all programs that allow you to type commands into your terminal and have them be executed. 
And so when we start up sh inside of our container, that's just another command shell that we can use to execute commands. Traditionally, a lot of the different containers that you're going to be working with are probably going to have the sh command or excuse me, or excuse me, the sh program already included. Some more complete versions of containers or images are going to also have the bash command processor as well. So in some cases, you can make use of bash directly. In vast majority, you're probably going to be able to run the shell inside there to start up a command prompt and type in some commands. Okay, so again, I think that you're probably going to be using docker exec dash it with sh as the command very, very often when you start doing your own Docker development. All right, so we've spoken a whole bunch around Docker CLI. Let's take one more break here. There's just one or two quick topics I want to talk about, and we'll start to move on to our next big topic. In the last section, we spoke about how we could open up a shell inside of a running container by using docker exec dash it and then passing in shell or just simply sh as the command that we want to execute. We've been talking about all this in the context of the exec command, which we can use to execute an additional command inside of a container. But if we wanted to, we could also run docker run, the original docker run command right here, along with that IT flag and start up a shell immediately when a container first starts up. Now, of course, if we start up a shell right when the container first starts, that's going to displace or keep any other typical or default command from running. But sometimes it is quite useful to get a empty container with a shell inside of it and just being able to poke around and not have any other process running. So let's try that out right now at our command line. I'm going to flip back over to my terminal. I'm going to run docker run. I'm going to put on the IT so that we can attach to standard in on the process that we're about to start up. I will run the busybox image, and then the pro program or the primary command that we're going to execute inside the container will be sh. So this means start up a new container out of the busybox image, run the sh program, which is a shell, and attach to standard in of that program. So when I run this, I'll be presented with a command prompt. And just like we saw a moment ago, I can run the ls command, I can ping google.com, and hit control C to stop it. I can echo a message, whatever I want to do. Again, this is a command that you might be using somewhat frequently anytime that you want to poke around a container. The downside to using Docker run with IT and SH is that chances are you're not going to be running any other process. It's a little bit more common that you're going to want to start up your container with a primary process of like maybe your web server or whatever it might be, and then attach to it a running shell by using the docker exec command, wherever it is right here. But I just wanted you to be aware of this alternate use of Docker Run. All right, now one last thing I want to cover in the next section. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we learned how to start up a shell inside of a container the instant that it was started. By the way, if you have a little bit of trouble exiting from this by hitting Control C, which is usually how we exit out of a container, remember you can either press Control D on your keyboard, or you can just type in exit like so, and it will kick you back out. Now in this section, there's one very small gotcha, maybe not even a gotcha, but just a very particular thing that I want to go over to make sure that it's really crystal clear on how containers behave. I want you to recall back to a little bit ago when we were initially talking about what a container is. Remember that we gave this example of where Chrome had needed a particular version of Python and Node.js needed its own version of Python. And we had said that through that namespacing feature, we can kind of imagine that our hard disk had two little segments carved out of it. And anytime Chrome tried to access that hard drive, it would get its own segment. Anytime Node.js tried to access the hard drive, it would get its own different segment. And so the thing that I want to make sure is really crystal clear is that between two containers, they do not automatically share their file system. We're going to do a quick demo inside of our terminal just to really confirm that that is the case. So I'm going to open up my terminal and I'm going to start up a new instance of that busy box image and I'm going to start up a shell inside there. So I'll do docker run dash it busybox shell. So now I can list my files and folders inside of here and I see just these default folders. I'm now going to open up a second terminal window and I'm going to start a second container with the same parameters. So second terminal window and I'll do docker run 
dash it busybox sh. Now I'm going to open up one more terminal window. So this is going to be a third one. And inside of here, I'll do docker ps. And I can verify that I have two separate containers, both running a shell. Now I'm going to go to the first terminal window. And inside of here, I'm going to create a new file with touch hi there, like so. That's going to create a new file called hi there. There it is right there. I can run ls and I'll see the file up here right away. Now here's the fun part. We're going to go over to the second terminal window and I'll do an ls over here as well. And of course, I am not going to see that file of hi there because these two running containers have absolutely completely separate file systems and there's no sharing of data between the two. Again, this is kind of a small thing, but I just wanted to make sure that it was very crystal clear. So in general, unless you and I specifically form up a connection between two containers, we really consider them to be more or less completely isolated from each other and totally separate. All right, so that's pretty much it on the basics of Docker. So we're going to take a quick pause right here. We're going to come back to the next section, and we're going to start moving on to the next big topic that we're going to cover. So I'll see you in just a minute.